Welcome to Insight. Today we are chatting with Frank Verporten, director of the Baker Museum in Naples, Florida. Frank has generously agreed to share some of his experience with us. I'd like to thank you, Frank, for joining us today. My pleasure. Thank you. Talk about your philosophy of how a museum can present art in service to mm -hmm. the works of those artists. Mm -hmm. So I want to give you an idea of this because in um, when I think of this uh, and as very existential question about um, what exhibitions we organize during our season. We organize almost 15 to 20 exhibitions per season, so we're constantly reflecting on this. Quite a vigorous yeah, schedule. It is a vigorous schedule, and we live in a very particular community, Naples, which is, as you know, um, a very uh, sort of, you know, there's a lot of wealth and affluent people. On the, so Naples is in southwest Florida. Constantly, we're trying to be very considerate about which exhibitions we organize, and we ensure that they are that they relate to our permanent collection so we have a collection of uh, 19th 20th century uh, modern american some european art as well and increasingly um, contemporary as well about 4000 works in the collection in addition to that we do have to uh, organize through the let's say the four or five peak attendance months of our season we try to bring in very high caliber exhibitions that sometimes don't necessarily 100% relate to our exhibition, but that's to our collection. But that's fine because their um, intention is to, uh, again, to bring patrons to the museum. Let's say the block of high attendance, peak attendance for us, and let's say that that's January through uh, April or something, right? Um, not always do we just present exhibitions that were organized by other organizations then. But what I mean by this, we have to ensure that there is some sort of greater appeal factor right. to those specific programs. What that means is also that because we are continually interested in also championing the work of artists who are uh, under, were under ex exposed or anything, right? But those traditionally we will not uh, put those on the on the schedule in that peak season. Right, and you can really debate whether we should in fact because very often you know we have an, an army of about 40 docents we're very fortunate um, people who help us they're really the ambassadors for our programs right and with the feedback that I get from them on, on our programs is very um, interesting for us and time after time I find that whenever we do present or organize an exhibition where we really present new scholarship on an artist who was underexposed or something um, that they come back with, um, you know, information uh, about uh, how they feel that this exhibition should be on view in high season. Why don't we? Why do we put it up now? Why don't? Why can't more patrons see this? And I think there is a little bit of hesitation because, of course, we do need to uh, ensure we have the right attendance and that uh, you know our museums are filled. I will add to this, and this is a specific challenge to Naples um, and perhaps in Miami as well, but we're constantly competing with uh, golf and beach goers. And, of course. You know, this is like, who am I to say that people on a perfect day in January when the sky is blue and the temperature is uh, 79 degrees, who am I to say that at 11 a.m. those people should not go to the golf course? Should we dramatically change the opening hours of the museum? I've often thought that if we change that entirely around that we would um, perhaps bring in more more uh, visitors but it's a little tricky to just say we're not going to open until 2 or 3 p.m. in the afternoon and be open until 9 p.m. for your convenience and I'm not sure that we're ready to do that that's a big leap. <laughs> so wh when you look at your collection how has that collection been shaped and 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 talk right. about any recent acquisitions that you've had. The museum is a very young um, museum and collection all in all uh, it's about 16 years old and we're really the museum is part of a multicultural, um, multidisciplinary campus. Uh, the name of our entire organization is um, Artists Naples. The organization was originally founded 25 years ago, specifically as the Philharmonic Center for the Arts. It was home to the Naples Philharmonic Orchestra, which still performs uh, masterwork series and so on and so forth. And then about 10 years later, the then CEO decided to also um, establish a visual arts program in a museum. First exhibitions were organized in the galleries adjacent to the uh, performing arts uh, venue. Mm -hmm. And then later a different building on the same campus was established and that's the Bacon Museum, named after the chairman of our board who heavily endowed that um, museum. So collection 
is very interesting. And I think, you know, of course, the, the more time goes by, um, the clearer I can see what are the foundational sub-collections and, and what parts of the collection perhaps were, were not meant to have been accepted into the collection. But this is a mistake that many uh, museums, whether they have encyclopedic collections or not, university art museums tend to do the same thing. They accept things, gifts from alumni, and then by year 18 of the museum's existence, you look on their website and, and they have say, a collection. What were they thinking? We have to be a little bit more savvy about how we disclose the focus and the strength of our collection. But I will tell you, I've been here now four years, and um, the strengths of our collection were, um, I, I would say originally there were three foundation collections, one of Mexican modern art acquired by uh, Harry Pollack and uh, Brian Naprinsky, were both very passionate collectors. And there you have the effect of like collections that were already curated really by very passionate and savvy expert collectors. So it's very interesting. The uh, third collection um, was originally amassed by the late Ahmed Erdogan, the Turkish-American music entrepreneur who founded Atlantic Records and yes. ran it arguably the most successful music entrepreneur uh, ever, right, in the music business in the United States at least. Few people know, I assume, that Ahmed Erdogan used his same instinct for which he was so renowned for um, picking up or discovering un unknown talent, right? He always said that uh, in the early days of Atlantic, half of the um, artists that they signed on were pure business propositions and the other half was complete gut instinct. And he said all of our greatest successes came from, from, the, gut instinct. from the gut instinct group. And so this same man had an interest in visual arts and uh, amassed together with a couple of associates, and it was one of the earliest groups actually to do that, really like a fund, an art fund. And they amassed this great collection of American abstract art. And then in addition to that, uh, we have just recently acquired, um, through bequest, sadly, of a great um, patron of the arts, Olga Hirschhorn, who died at the blessed age of 95 last year. Um, Olga was the widow of uh, Joseph Hirschhorn, who was one of the most iconic uh, art collectors in the 50s and 60s. So she left that collection to us, in addition with the things in the bequest and earlier gifts, it's almost 800 works of art. And we currently have an exhibition on display so from our permanent collection um, on the third floor of the museum, and that specifically is a tribute to her uh, collection and to the gift she has left for this community and this museum to enjoy. And so that is very, very cool when you can, because we're storytellers also, right? right. With our exhibitions, it's very cool when you can relate those things to correspondence and relationships and friendships and travels and stuff. Van Poporten, thank you so much for thank sharing. You the works that you present every day. And thank you so much Again, for your insights. Great pleasure. Thank you so much.